Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and it's time for a super special video. So as you know, we are heading towards the official release of Guilds of Ravnica coming out this Friday, and that means it is time to talk about the set and what it's going to do in various constructed formats. So today is standard day, and I've got a super special guest. You probably know him from the podcast, uh, know him from playing dragons on the SC tour in Card Kingdom. Chris Van Meter, how's it going today, Chris? Uh, I am doing very good. I'm excited to talk more about Guilds of Ravnica because it is fantastic. Uh, yes, I am super excited for it. And I got to ask you, before we get into the individual cards, and this is a little bit of a weird question because rotation and format changing, but how strong of a set do you think this is? Like, if you look at standard sets, maybe Kaladash is a pretty powerful set. Then you have other sets that are kind of lower on the power scale. Where would you rank, just from a meta perspective, Guilds of Ravnica power level-wise for standard? Uh, so... In the meta of standard, I think that it's <coughs> exceptionally powerful right now, and it has to be because of the rotation. So if if uh, this set was like, say, a Born of the Gods or a Journey into Nyx power level, when we have the rotation, lose, lose a bunch of cards, standard would just be a big dud. But because this is kind of the set that I feel like is going to have to prop up sta this standard format. It had to be very powerful. That's why we only have five guilds instead of ten. Uh, and I think that it is like Return to Ravnica level of power. Yeah, I think it it looks super powerful, and I am super excited, and I'm doubly excited because uh, you've been playing a lot of standard, so I think you're the perfect person to talk about some standard cards because you've been testing and actually playing the format, and we're recording this uh, even before the pre-release, but you've already been working on the format, so I'm excited to hear your opinion, and uh, yeah, let's jump into our countdown, starting with a few honorable mentions. So we have a bunch of good uncommons and commons, which are probably going to show up in decks. Uh, so first off, we have Flower Flourish, Deadweight, Chemister's Insight, Thought Eraser. Any thoughts on these ones, Chris? Uh, so those are very, very good. Uh, Flower Flourish is, uh, in my opinion, the, the second best of the split cards. Um, the first best being in our top 10 list. Uh, but it's very good. It fills this role uh, similar to what Attune with the Aether did in uh, Four Color Energy. Uh, granted, it's not as busted because the energy mechanic was kind of insane, but it allows you to shave your lands, still curve out. When combined with the Convoke mechanic of Celestia, it gives you a lot of double or triple spell turns early on, which is very, very powerful and helps kind of push that tempo. But then as you get into the mid to the late game, you also just have like an overrun style effect where you can give all of your creatures plus two plus two so it makes combat a nightmare and when you're playing a token style deck which is what Celestia is very good at with this Ravnica set it's just a, a thought that has to be in the back of your opponent's mind all the time as you're playing uh, in the late game. Uh, as for the other cards, uh, Thought Erasure is very powerful. Uh, it's a Thought Seize like effect where you get to take any non-land card and you get to Surveil and there are a lot of surveil payoffs and you know good synergy with surveil in the set. And I think that Deadweight is a card that's kind of going to fly under the radar. The format is very proactive, very aggressive, and you want to be able to interact with your opponent as early as turn one, especially the mono red decks. So I think that we're going to see a lot of Deadweights in the 75, not so much in the main deck maybe, but they'll definitely be there uh, so that you can interact when you're on the draw. We also have a couple more commons and uncommons to mention a couple of ramp spells or mana fixing spells district guide and circuitous rue and also uh demotion which is kind of an oddball i was surprised to see that is this our uh like swords to plowshares type effect to the format chris yeah so uh i'll touch on the ramp spells first um well, Circuitous Route is the Alley and Trazi special, and I expect us to see a lot of four or five color decks with Circuitous Route and Gilded Lotus and our, the three mana artifact that was just reprinted that lets uh, you land Chromatic Lantern, color, yes. Chromatic Lantern. So it's certainly going to open up a lot of things, and I think that that card especially will be a cornerstone of standard once we have the next Ravnica set to give us the last five guilds. District Guide, Jerry Thompson has done a, a very good job about talking about how good this card is, but it really uh, fills this role of branching your 
you know, your threes to your fives, which is where a lot of the, the big power lays in standard. And it just, the format is very aggressive and proactive. And the ways to kind of buffer that is to just be a really good mid range deck. Uh, so I think we're going to end up seeing proactive and mid range kind of battling back and forth for now. Since we don't have the Azorius Guild yet, I think control is in a bad spot. As for demotion, yeah, I think it's similar to a source to plowshares like effect. Uh, for one mana, being able to just make a creature not able to block is very, very good. And if you're playing a deck with Tajik or just any of the aggressive Boros decks, you don't really care about getting rid of the creature. You just want mana efficient ways to push through damage. And I think demotion is very, very good at doing that. All right, let's move on to our top 10 proper. So number 10 on our list, you're a big fan of the split cards, Chris. Fine finality. So what do you think of this? like sort of grindy languish card advantage thing what are you doing with this one it is super super grindy uh and the thing that i like the most about it is its flexibility so i've used it in a lot of my golgari decks just as a way to like find creatures that i'm milling with like stitcher supplier or glow spore shaman uh but it also is just a very good card out of the sideboard of like the Lanoir Elf, Steel Leaf Champion, like green aggressive decks. Because you can play the first half is just green green. It can be very, very good at just grinding through your opponent. If they happen to have a lot of removal and you know you play your threats, play your threats, play your threats, they kill them, and then you just get to play find and draw two of them back. Two mana draw two is very, very good in green. On top of that, if you have access to black mana, it is just a six mana sweeper. Minus four, minus four is going to kill most creatures in the format. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about the Steel Leaf Stompy decks because I've already seen some of those decks splashing black uh, for Assassin's Trophy. So if you're already splashing black, having the wrath that your creatures, at least some of them, uh, are going to survive could be a nice little upside there if you can somehow manage to cast it with your Ferox out, which might be a little bit of a challenge. So uh, definitely seems like a perfect Golgari card. It seems like almost all Golgari decks these days are at least somewhat graveyard focused. So it doesn't seem that hard to get the draw two effect out of your graveyard in Golgari. Plus, in, in those colors, there are a lot of creatures that have spell like effects. So you have things like Kite Sail Freebooter, District Guide, Ravenous Chupacabra. All of these are going to give you those spell like effects that are stapled on the creatures that you can rebuy with the fine side. Well, let's move on. Number nine on our list. We have one of my favorite modern cards from the set, Night of Autumn, kind of like a charm, but on a pretty reasonably sized body. So what do you think of this one, Chris? I really like Night of Autumn, and it's one of the reasons to branch out into a different color if you are either in green or white, since we have access to the lands, uh, the Temple Garden from Guilds of Ravnica. 4-3 is a decent sized body and it allows you to put pressure on or play some defense if you need to, but gaining 4 life against the red decks is awesome, and just having a main deck chance to snag a Search for Ascanta or an Arguel's Bloodfast has been fantastic. On top of that, I think that the Eldest Reborn is one of the best and most powerful cards in the standard format. Then this just gives you a main deck answer to kind of insulate yourself from uh, losing too much advantage to it. Yeah, and I mean, in standard, a 4-3 for 3 isn't really that far below the curve anyway. One thing I was wondering about with Knight of Autumn, uh, Celestia is kind of the token guild, where we're going wide with these tokens. Does this fit in those decks? If you're building a token-y Celestia deck, are you going to have this in your 75? Are you going to have it in your main deck? Or is this for more like mid-rangey abzan three color piles i think it's certainly more uh slated for like the three color pile decks because then you would just play it in your main deck as like a value creature for like straight celestia i would have it in the sideboard i don't think that you need to kind of muddy your main deck for it you're already very good against the eldest reborn because you have a bunch of tokens that you can get rid of uh you're uh you know likely going to be able to grind against the um you know, any deck that, it, that would have Search for Ascanta. So I certainly would have it. Uh, and if it hadn't been printed, I would be recommending Reclamation Sage. But I would have it in the sideboard of my Celestia decks and in the main deck of, like, my three-color piles. Well, let's move on. Number eight on our list, we have another Selesnia card to some extent, <coughs> Conclave Tribunal, our new Oblivion Ring with Convoke. So uh, is this card a token card, Chris, or can this show up outside of dedicated Selesnia token lists as well? Uh, while it shines in the token decks, it will show up outside of the Selesnia decks. And for the, the reason being that uh, 
the card History of Benalia is just so powerful. It's one of the premier threats in the format, and you don't have to just be tokens to be able to take advantage of that card, uh, and Conclave Tribunal plays very well with it. On top of that, you also have things like Amara, Soul of the Accord, which, while it generates tokens, it is just an aggressive creature that you can use either in your Celestia deck, your Abzan deck, or even a Naya deck if you wanted to. In uh, Conclave Tribunal, having Convoke, and that Oblivion Ring effect allows to, for some double spell turns where you're able to answer a threat and pose a threat yourself on the same turn and steal the tempo back from your opponent. Let's move on to number seven on our list. And here we kind of have a uh, double trouble, two cards in one, Tajik and also Swift Blade Vindicator. So Chris, our new two and three drop in the Boros colors. Uh, what do you think about these cards? Uh, so they are very, very powerful. Uh, and at first I was really excited to play with these cards. Um, but it's one of those things where it, its benefit is becoming its detriment to where the set's not even out yet and it's already kind of warping the meta. Um, it, in my testing, like I have, you know, the Boros deck is basically one of the litmus tests for the format and Swift Blade Vindicator and Tajik Legion's Edge are always going to be those two cards that are seen play together. Uh, and if your opponent stumbles, you're going to run them over. But in my experience, there's not a whole lot of reach. So solving that problem uh, is going to be the key to kind of breaking the format if you wanted to stay on Boros. I have definitely played against the Boros deck. And if you don't have the right answer at the right time, or if you uh, stumble a little bit with your three color mana base, these are really scary cards that can kill you really quickly. If you just Swift Blade Vindicator into Tajik, into a really uh, that's a really efficient and fast way to close out the game. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to number six on our list. We have a new sweeper, like a semi-sweeper. Ritual of Su We don't get full three-mana rests anymore, but this one is still a pretty good one. And we were just talking about the scariness of the Boros deck. Uh, <laughs> is this one of the answers that can keep those scary, efficient Boros creatures in check? It absolutely is. Uh, Ritual of Soot is going to be a mainstay for any mid-range decks that have black at the centerpiece, or even control decks like a Demir control deck or an Esper control deck. Uh, it's very good against the aggressive Boros deck. It's also very good against the Mono Red deck. So you think, you know, Mono Red likely going to have a lot of burn, Wizards Lightning, Shock, Lightning Strike. But there's also just a ton of creatures that they have to play. Wizards to support the, the tribal benefits. Um, the, you know, there's not much burn outside of that, so you're generally going to be looking at quite a few creatures, and Ritual of Soot does a good job of cleaning that up. Yeah, uh, I think it's also very good against the token decks. I think if you look at how the guilds break down in some of the decks that are probably going to be played moving forward, we mentioned Boros, Mono Red, also very powerful against the token strategies, which are another deck that I think is getting a reasonable amount of hype. Uh, my question for this one is, it's always weird with these kind of conditional wraths. Uh, is this a main deck card? Is this something where you think the metagame, week one, week two, uh, are there going to be enough of those cheap creature decks that you're going to want some number of these in your main deck? Are you sitting these in your sideboard for when you run into those matchups where it's great? So uh, week one, week two, certainly going to see a lot of these aggressive decks because those are usually just the you know level one decks that are played at the beginning of the format. You don't have to tweak the list a lot. You just have to find you know the most efficient aggressive cards and, and go from there. Rich Love Suit is going to be a good main deck inclusion in some number. But on top of that, you also have cards like Chemister's Insight that you can play along with it. The, the jumpstart ability of it allows you to discard those cards that you know you may not otherwise want. Plus, in that color, you have access to Surveil, which gives you a way to kind of scry past those cards and put them in your graveyard. Yeah, that's a good point. Kind of minimizes the downside of the conditionalness of Ritual of Set. Let's move on. We have so many Boros cards. Uh, Legion War Boss. I guess we might be underselling Legion War Boss to call it just a Boros card because this has some potential outside of just the straightforward Boros aggro deck, right, Chris? Yeah, I think that Legion War Boss is very, very good. Very similar to uh, Rabble Master. Uh, and much like how I had success with Rabble Master and Green Red, Green Red Monsters or Jun Monsters, uh, Legion War Boss is going to be, you know, accessible to any deck just using red. I tend to, to also like it as like a, 
you know, a finisher and a Jun style deck. So if you can imagine, especially in the next set when we finally have access to Blood Crypt and Stomping Ground, just a deck that's a pile of removal and discard and then War Boss to, to clean, clean out the game. So yes, it's very good in the Boros deck. It does have Mentor, but it goes in Mono Red. Uh, you know, it can be used as a finisher in any deck that has access to red, like a Naya deck maybe. Uh, you can even use it like out of the sideboard of a Jeskai Control deck when your opponent is siding out all of their removal against you. Uh, so it certainly is flexible and powerful <coughs> at that same level that Rebel Master was. Yeah, it's definitely a scary card. It's one of those cards where it just demands an answer very quickly, or it can take over the game by itself, and for three mana, that's a pretty good deal. If your three mana creature can win the game on its own, similar to Goblin Rebel Master is a classic example of that, uh, you know you got a pretty powerful card. So I will be interested to see what happens with this card, because unlike a lot of the cards we've talked about, which have been, okay, this goes in Boros, this goes in a like mid-range black deck, there's a lot of possibilities for Legion Warboss, and I expect we'll see a lot of people trying a lot of different things with this card moving forward. And, and it's important to remember that it is only 3 mana, so it dies to Ritual Suit. That's true. We have a natural safety valve in case Legion War Boss gets <laughs> too good. <laughs> well, let's move on. Number 3, uh, 4 on our list, rather. We have, I promise, our last Boros card, Aurelia Exemplar of Justice, and I've only played a few games of Guilds of Ravnica so far, uh, because this set's just coming out online, and I have definitely been pretty scared of Aurelia coming down on turn four, getting in that hasty damage, and having an oddly big butt that dodges some removal spells, depending on the deck you're playing. What do you think about this one, Chris? Yeah, I think that at first I thought that Aurelia was just going to be like a key piece of, of the aggressive Boros deck, but as I've been playing around with some more, you know, mid-rangey Naya or Jeskai decks, Aurelia is actually just a very good threat on her own. She plays offense and defense very well, and it's the type of card that can help you turn the corner when you actually need to, to, to end the game. So, you know, I've had some games in like a just, a just guy, you know, mid range ish list where I'm able to, you know, like Dream Eater on end step, Aurelia pump my Dream Eater, get in for a bunch of damage and still have this big body black on, back on defense. So she is more flexible than, uh, you would think just looking at her colors and stats. Yeah, it seems like it was kind of a cookie cutter card to be the top end of the Boros deck, but I think you're right that it is a lot more flexible. The ability to give herself vigilance to be back on defense is really huge. Uh, it's an angel, which has some relevant tribal synergies with Lyra. Uh, I found it interesting that you mentioned Dream Eater. I'm getting off topic here, but I got to ask you, that was a card that I think people were like a little bit meh on. How was your experience with that one, Ben? Because I've actually been surprised every time I have cast Dream Eater, I've been like, wow, this card is actually very powerful. Yeah, so Dream Eater is uh, like my pick for underrated Mythic of the set. Um, and I'm glad I got my set when I did at the low, low price it's sitting around like 350 or $4 or something. Um, I, I didn't include it in this list um, because it's I'm still a little more speculative on it because I'm not quite sure what deck that it can go into. Uh, but if there does end up being a good deck in standard uh, that has blue in it, then Dream Eater is going to be one of the best cards in the deck. Yeah, uh, I I think I vastly underrated that card. And when we finish podcasting, I'll probably go pick up uh, my set too, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on to number three on our list and kind of a funny story here. This was a late addition to our list. Initially, No Hide Ferox was not on our list. And then Chris, you've done some more like playing with and against this card and you were like, we got to have it. We got to include it on the list. So tell us about No Hide Ferox. This card is busted. It is so big. It taxes your opponent's mana. It's so difficult to to contend with like it's even got me to the point where i'm wanting to play like one one death touch creatures for one as, as ways to stop it from from beating me down uh you know lanoir elves steel leaf champion no hide ferox is just going to be the cornerstone of one of the most popular and successful decks in the standard format so having ways to interact with it favorably is going to be very very good and every time you play no hide ferox your opponent's going to look down at their 15 dollars copies of raska's content <laughs> and feel very bad uh the the card just does so much and the one of the big drawbacks to it is that it doesn't have any way to push through damage uh and at work uh earlier today i was talking with uh one of my co-workers about what they were working on in standard and they showed me a list that had gore claw Terror of Calcisma alongside the Nohide Ferox. 
which is interesting because not only does it make it only cost green green for your 6-6 hexproof creature, but when your Gorklaw attacks, it gives it trample. Uh, that's just insane. Yeah, that does actually sound pretty powerful. I kind of forgot about the trample ability on Glorical. That sounds like a pretty spicy list. Yeah, I I am definitely scared of this card. This card just dodges so much removal, and it comes down so quickly in a standard where we have Lana War Elves on turn one, and where we already had a really good mono green deck that didn't really lose too many pieces. It just naturally slots into a deck that was already one of the better decks in the format and already not losing a ton at rotation. So I expect a little... This is one of the cards that I'm expecting to see a lot of right away. I think alongside like that Boros list, just playing your mono green or green with a splash for a bit of removal stompy list seems like it'll probably be a popular choice right away in Guilds of Ravnica standard. Well, let's move on to number two on our list. And here we have an entire cycle of cards, but we can't really skip over the shock lands. They are pretty impactful to the format. So Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit about the value of shock lands and what they do for standard? Uh, so this this standard uh, mana base with the shocks and the buddy lands is exactly the same that we had the last time we were in Ravnica, uh, and it's great. Like you could play, you know, once we have access to everything, especially considering we have like Circuitous Route, District Guide, and Chromatic Lantern. Like you're going to be able to play five colors once we have the next set come out. Uh, so the shock lands uh, certainly open things up and they allow you to play a whole bunch of colors. But what I really like about it is there is an opportunity cost to it uh, with with the life that you have to pay to access the lands untapped. So if you think back to like the cons of Tarkir Battle for Zendikar standard format where like four colors was literally free because of all the fetches and the battle lands that you could play, uh, with the shock lands it's not exactly that free so you have to make your conscious decisions on what colors to play, but you do have the option to play them all. So, uh, I think that's a very good breakdown. Question for you, until we get to the winner set, how important is it to, if you're building a three-color deck, to have access to two shock lands? Is that like determining uh, which wedges and shards are playable and which ones are not until we get to the winner set? I, I think so. Like, I've tried to make, like, Jund work. Um, you know, the, the Turbo Fog deck is Bant, uh, even though we're missing some of those lands just because, like, you can lean heavily into certain colors. Um, but I feel like if you're going to play three colors and it's not a set that can play two sets of dual lands, you have to have a very good reason to be trying to make the mana work. Well, let's move on to our number one card at the very top of our list and probably surprising no one. Assassin's Trophy. This card has been dropping jaws since it was spoiled. So Chris, what does this one do in standard and specific? So in standard and specific, it does a few things. It gives you, like, the catch-all answer for your Jun-style deck. And I expect it to actually just be very, very good once we have the next set. Uh, Because then, like, once you have access to the Rakdos cards and the uh, Gruul cards, then you can kind of just, like, build this Jun-style deck. Um, But it pairs so beautifully with Nullhide Ferox. It's just kind of unbelievable how perfect those two cards are for each other. Ferox wants you to build a deck with not a whole lot of non-creature spells. An Assassin's Trophy doesn't require you to play a whole bunch more non-creature spells to kind of vary your answers for things, because it is just a catch-all uh, in and of itself. So I think that that you know when playing with the card in like some of the mid-range decks, uh, I always find myself wanting at least two, if not more. Uh, but it's it's just going to end up being a card that kind of shapes how you build your deck and how you play the game because you know if you know if you're playing against the golgari deck you can't really afford to just like spend six mana on a do nothing card because it's just going to get destroyed how big of a drawback is the land thing is that something that scares should scare you at all as far as how many of these you put in your deck uh so it, do- it doesn't scare you but it does kind of help tailor it right so like i don't think that um, you're, you're just going to want to play four, uh, because if you're in black, like you can have access to Raska's Contempt, which is like the perfect card to complement Assassin's Trophy. Uh, but it's one of those cards where like I'm never unhappy with having at least two in my main deck, uh, and three would probably also be fine. I don't really see myself wanting to play four, which is kind of weird. Um, but as as the format kind of progresses and you kind of like 
once we know what the threats are going to be, that will be able to tell us if it's okay just to play four trophies, because then it won't matter. You can answer everything. Well, uh, last question on Assassin's Trophy. Do you think it is better in Standard, Modern, or Legacy? Which of the three main formats is Assassin's Trophy best in? I think that it's actually better in Modern. Uh, the Modern decks are built to be as sleek and as low to the ground and as efficient as possible. And utilizing this card is a way to kind of hyper-focus your removal in and not have to play a diverse array of answers really, really helps you stay along that same line of being hyper-focused and sleek. Uh, plus, like, it just being able to interact with any permanent is invaluable in modern. I think it's very good in standard, but it's certainly a level above in modern. And you get around some of the land drawback. In standard, everyone's going to have basic lands. In modern, sometimes you just randomly get people, and they they fetch out their only basic, and then you assassin's trophy them. And that's the best feeling. When you get to blow up their best thing, and they don't get a land, you feel like you just you won the game, even if you end up losing. (laughs) Yeah, it's certainly a moral victory, that's for sure. Uh, And I think that brings us to the end of our top 10 standard cards from Guilds of Ravnica. So, Chris, any thoughts on anything on the way out the door today? Yeah, actually, uh, there's one last card that I want to bring up, and a card that I am guilty of uh, making a judgment before actually casting it. And so this this tends to happen a lot with Planeswalkers in particular, where one will get spoiled, you'll see it, and be like, oh, well, that just seems terrible. And then the first time you cast it, you're like, oh my god, I'm a moron, uh, because I didn't realize this. So the first time that happened to me was with Elspeth Sun's Champion. I, I thought that card didn't look very good during the, the Theros preview season, I cast it against BBD in our versus video and was instantly in love with how powerful it is. And that's happening with Vraska, Queen of the Golgari. Uh, so that card is very, very underrated. Um, I think that it's going to be a big player in standard. I'm really looking forward to what we can do with it in the Jun Shard. I keep coming back to it, but that's what I enjoy playing. Uh, but it's just, it's so much better than I gave it credit for simply because the abrupt decay portion of it is very very good in standard because cards are also powerful and whoever has the most two for ones is going to win uh so there's going to be a lot of games where you kind of like play play back and forth and just play Vraska, tick it down and kill their threat and then from there you get to untap and start taking advantage of you know the plus two growing the loyalty back if you have any effects to you know make you want to sacrifice your own creatures it's great in the mid to late game you can actually just cash in lands for extra cards she is so much better than i thought she was and i'm kind of glad that i waited for her to go down before i pre-ordered them because she's going to go back up the ability to get a easy not just two for one but often like three for one and i guess planeswalkers always kind of do that but being able to like tick down and kill something and then tick up to draw a card then even tick down again just even the two abrupt decay effects is such a massive swing and six loyalty that's a lot of loyalty like if you tick up right away it doesn't look like you really have much protection you're sacking your own thing it's like anti-protection but six loyalty is a lot to fight through so i think that's a that's a good one would you have slotted Veraska into this list if we were making the list right now Yes, I'm not sure where she would slot in. I, I would probably like club Aurelia with Tajik and Swiftblade Vindicator and put her somewhere in the top 10. So I do think she is one of the, the top 10 cards in the set now after playing with her a little bit. Um, but I'm not sure exactly where I would slot it in. Anyway, that brings us to the end of our top 10 video. Chris, thanks for doing it. Good luck and your quest uh, and your week one standard tournament you were telling me before we recorded this you have the record for most week one wins at scg tournaments is that is that correct i think so i, I don't have the exact data uh but i do have three trophies uh from release week uh events two standard one legacy and i also won the standard tournament the second week that dragons of Tarkir was released so my track record is good. I, I, I'm usually able to kind of dial in on what the meta is going to be and, you know, find a good version of the best deck. Uh, and hopefully I can do it again for the team tournament. I'll be in Columbus playing with Jeff Hoagland and Kent Ketter. Well, good luck to all you making it trophy number five. That would be awesome. So thanks for doing it. Thanks to everyone for watching. And uh, yeah. We will talk to you soon. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, help us out by clicking that like button down below. And to keep up on all the latest and greatest, click that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit that bell icon to get alerts whenever we have new videos. And if you want to, check out some of our other sweet videos here and here.